And so because we uh, want to have enough time to spend uh, praying for everyone, uh, we're just going to jump into the message. We're going to jump right into it. So the title of tonight's message is, uh, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Again, if you're taking notes, I know I said it pretty quickly. (laughs) If you're taking notes, the title is, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. Um, So for those of you who are in here for the very first time, uh, we're studying through the Gospel of Matthew, and and we are currently going through the Sermon on the Mount, as you can tell by the the artwork. Uh, We've been looking closely at Jesus' words, and we're going to continue to do the same thing tonight. But before we do that, we must pray. So let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for everybody who's here. Lord, I just, I pray now, God, that everything that happens tonight would be according to to your will, that it would be for your glory. Uh, God, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would change us. I pray that you would encourage us. Holy Spirit, uh, please, please empty us of ourselves, of our ego, of our pride, of our arrogance, and fill us with you so that we can hear your word implanted and be changed by it. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Oh, and then a side note, this is what happens when you uh, run out of the house last minute, like you're leaving super quick, and uh, you forget your rings. So you get, some, you get some pink tape, and then you put it around your finger uh, to, you know, to let these, let these broads know. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not why. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so back to serious things. Uh, in, uh, in the portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at uh, last week and that we're going to continue to look at tonight and in the coming weeks, Jesus is clarifying some things from the law of God. He's, he's filling up what the people and the religious leaders of his day were missing. Uh, so we're just going to start by reading our verses for tonight. We're going we're gonna to be reading Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 17 through 21st to get a little bit of context, and then we're going to jump down to verse 27 through 30. So Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Jump down to verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And so Jesus starts this portion of his clarification of the law by calling out uh, the act of idolatry, you know, the, the command to not commit adultery is, of course, uh, one of the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. It was a command that, if broken, was punishable by death. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, and the religious leaders brought her to Jesus, and they said, hey, the law says that this woman should be stoned to death for, for what she did. They were not wrong. They were not wrong. That's what the law says. But of course, Jesus flips the script on them and he says, well, whoever is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And obviously it's like, okay, well, it counts me out. And so they all walk away and Jesus is like, yeah, look, no one condemns you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And uh, that's amazing because that, that's the grace and the mercy of God that is still available to us. That's, uh, that's, that's the grace and mercy of God that is, that is for us and for our, our sins. He treats us the very same way. He says, hey, I don't condemn you, but hey, go and sin no more. Repent. So the act of committing adultery, uh, it's, it has a pretty explicit definition, right? Like it's, it's, it's not wide ranging. It's, it's very explicit. It's, you know, sexual intercourse between two people and either one of them or both of them are married to someone else. Uh, that's, that's what adultery is. Uh, last week, we talked about the violation of the sanctity of life. We talked about murder. If, if you guys were not here for that, you want to hear it, go check us out on YouTube or Spotify, Zeal Young Adults. 
Um, but last week, that's what we talked about, the, the violation of the sanctity of life. And this week, tonight, we're talking about the violation of the sanctity of marriage. And so obviously, if one half of a marriage decides to go and have sex with someone who is not their spouse, then they have violated that marriage covenant, and so has the person who the adultery was committed with. Sex was given to us by God, and it was given to us by God to be used in one context and one context alone, and that is in the marriage covenant. That's it. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to have to say this because I firmly believe that there is only one definition of marriage, so it pains me that I have to be so specific in our culture, but the marriage covenant is between one man and one woman, okay? And to make this even more painful, that's one biological man and one biological woman. It's the only definition of men and women that matters. And we have a lot of mentally ill people out there. We have a lot of silly opportunists that are trying to change these definitions. Uh, but this is what a man and a woman is, and this is what marriage is, according to the Bible. And sex was given to us. Sex was given to us to be enjoyed in the context of a marriage covenant. Sex is one of the most intimate things that, that two people can do, and, and that intimacy is strictly meant for those who have promised to spend the rest of their lives together in a marriage in a marriage. Additionally, sex has been given uh, for marriage because in this intimate act, in this intimate act of sex, with all things functioning correctly and functioning as they should, a child is produced. New life is produced through this act. It's, it's been said that um, having children, it's, it's like a picture of the triune Godhead. You know, you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit existing in love, and then you have the husband, the wife, and a child existing in love. You know, both of these triunities, they do not exist apart from the bond of love, or at least ideally, these, these things do not exist without the bond of love. Humanity, you know, we tend to break these good things that God has given us. Love isn't always involved in creating children nowadays, but, but sex is a good thing. Sex is a good thing, and, and sex is something that is supposed to be enjoyed and used as an expression of love. It produces more life, which then produces more love. And sex is something that is supposed to remain in-house. This remains in-house. This is not something that is shared with others, nor is it something that is to be engaged in if you are not married. And this includes sex in all of its forms. You know, it's so, it's so startling for me when I hear that, you know, people believe that they have been sexually moral or they've been sexually pure because they've never had sex, yet they've done everything else but that. Everything else they've done. There, there's been no act, like the physical act of creating a baby hasn't taken place, but all kinds of other sexual acts have taken place. You are still behaving sexually immoral and you are still behaving sexually impure even if you've never had traditional sexual intercourse. And, and before anyone approaches me after service and says, well, how far can I go before I cross the line? You've already crossed the line. You've already crossed the line. You're, you're already starting from a place of immorality. The question should never be, it should never be like, how much can I get away with before it, before it crosses into sin? That should never be the question. The question should always be, how much can I die to? How much can I run away from? How much can I forsake in order to glorify God? That's the question. And so the issue that Jesus is addressing goes beyond strictly adultery. What Jesus is addressing goes beyond adultery, the act of sexual intercourse that involves someone who is already married to someone else. The issue that Jesus is addressing here is all sexual immorality, all sexual immorality, which is evidenced by the fact that Jesus says everyone who looks at a woman, right? Like he doesn't say every married person who looks at a married woman, or he doesn't say every married person who looks at a single woman, and he doesn't say every single man or single person who looks at a married woman. The, the, the marital statuses of these people are not given. They're not given. 
So it's not strictly adultery that Jesus is talking about here. He simply states, everyone who looks at a woman, a look that is an intentional and repeated gazing, an intentional and repeated gazing. This isn't an involuntary, accidental, out of nowhere realization of of what you're looking at. This is a continuous process of looking, of looking. And he states everyone, he states that everyone who looks and gazes intentionally and continuously at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What does this mean? What, what, does, what does lustfully mean? Well, the word that's used in Greek, I don't expect you to remember it. I'm not going to remember it after tonight, but it's epithumeo. Epithumeo is the Greek word, and it means to have a strong desire for to desire to possess, to desire sexually, to long for, to covet. And look, this could be a good thing. This, this could be a good thing. It's perfectly okay to lust after your husband or to lust after your wife. It's kind of encouraged. It's okay to do that. But when this lust, when this desire to possess, this longing to have is directed at someone who is not your spouse, when this lust or desire for another is elevated above your desire for God or to do things God's way, you've crossed the line. What would you do if given the opportunity and you knew that no one would find out? That's a good question to ask yourself when you're thinking about lusting and to know where your heart is. According to Jesus, if you've done this, if, if you've looked intentionally and longingly with the desire to possess and to have sexually, you've already committed adultery with this person in your heart. Now, I believe that it needs to be stated, and it should have been stated last week, uh, that although Jesus is equating these things, he's equating these things, he is, he is presenting these things as, as, as being on the same level. Last week, we talked about anger and ill feelings and contempt, etc., towards others, and, and those are on the same level as murder, is what we talked about last week. And tonight, the act of intentionally and continuously looking at someone with the desire to have and possess that person sexually is on the same level as adultery. It needs to be said that although these things are being equated with each other, they are not the same thing. Being angry with someone is not in fact or pragmatically the same thing as ending someone's life. They don't have the same consequences and the same implications. You know, one is not loving your neighbor, and which could result in a riff in the relationship between you and your neighbor and between you and God. The other is also not loving your neighbor, but this will result in a family grieving over the loss of a loved one. It will result in you going to prison. It will result in the destruction of many lives, including your own. Things will be practically different when you actually murder someone as opposed to being angry with them in your heart. Likewise, looking lustfully at someone, it's not in fact or pragmatically the same thing as committing adultery. They also don't have the same consequences or implications. One is not loving your neighbor and results in an incorrect view of your neighbor. The other is also not loving your neighbor, but will also result in a broken marriage, in a broken family, many other relationships being broken. Things will practically be different when you actually commit adultery. So these actions, they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Don't think to yourself because you've had a lustful thought, well, I might as well go ahead and seal the deal. Might as well go ahead and finish this since it's already, it's already adultery in the heart. No. And also don't think to yourself that because you had a lustful thought towards someone that, oh, well, now you need to be stoned to death because it's already been adultery. It's already adultery, so you need, you need to die. You need to face the death penalty. Warren Wiersbe, he says it like this, quote, Jesus is not saying that lustful desires are identical to lustful deeds. And therefore, a person might just as well ahead and go ahead and commit adultery. The desire and the deed are not identical. 
but spiritually speaking, they are equivalent. They are equivalent, end quote. As far as God is concerned, though the desire and the deed are not the same practically, the desire and the deed are spiritually equivalent because the deed begins with the desire. The desire is the seed that leads to the deed. Check one, two, right? That was a good rhyme. I thought that was dope. The desire is the seed that leads to the deed. James chapter one, verses 14 and 15 says it like this. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So the desire isn't the same thing as the deed, speaking in practical terms, but the desire and the deed are spiritually equivalent because the desire starts the whole thing off. Desire starts the whole thing off. Evil desire degenerates into sin and then into death. So in God's eyes, the activity is just as criminal in the desire phase as it is in the act phase, in the deed phase. So if that's the case, if that's the case, how do we protect ourselves from entering into the desire phase of this whole thing? How do we keep that seed from being planted in our mind? Well, Jesus, he, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So it's obvious here, it's obvious that Jesus is speaking figuratively about gouging and cutting off body parts. If, if, he, if he was speaking literally, it would go against the whole heart of this sermon on the mount, which is the issue of the heart. He's already made the point that the outward physical activities, they don't make anyone righteous. So it stands to reason that Jesus is not saying in one breath, hey, it's not about the outward, but it's about the heart. And then in the very next breath, he says, well, you need to fix this inward heart thing with an outward masochism. He's not saying that. Chopping off your hand that sins or plucking out your eye that looks lustfully, it's not gonna solve the issue of the heart. You're still gonna have your heart after you've mutilated your body. What Jesus is talking about is severing. He's talking about severing or cutting off any avenue that sinful desires can take into your heart and your mind. This is a spiritual battle that must be taken seriously. What does it say in Ephesians 6, 12? It says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your struggle isn't the fact that, that you are being tempted to lust after a flesh and blood person of the opposite sex or the same sex, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Your endeavors to obey Jesus by cutting off and severing sin's access into your heart and mind is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. That's why just before what I just read in Ephesians in chapter six, verses 10 and 11, Paul says this, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and, his, and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. This is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle. So the first thing that you need to have squared away as you battle is your closeness to Jesus. Your closeness to Jesus. It has to start with growing closer to Jesus. I have found that the closer that I get to Christ, the more sensitive I am to the sin in my life. I was talking with Jesse last week. Where is he? Jesse, yeah. I was talking with Jesse last week and uh, he brought up a quote from Billy Graham. I don't remember the exact words, but it basically stated, the more clearly he sees Jesus, the more clearly he sees his sin. That's the truth. That's the truth. And it's hard sometimes. It's hard to see your sin more clearly sometimes because the things that you didn't think were that big of a deal, maybe like a year ago or even like a month ago, now you're realizing like, Nah, this, this little sin that I thought was little, it is not little. It is a big deal in the eyes of God because every sin is a big deal in the eyes of God. 
But the closer I get to Jesus, the closer I get to Jesus, the more sensitive I am to sin. And the more sensitive I am to the first fruits of sin, the first fruits of sin. It used to be before, before I came to the Lord that getting drunk, I had no problem with it. I used to get drunk all the time. I was okay with it. Never felt guilty, never felt convicted. It was fine. But then I came to the Lord. Then I came to the Lord. And as I grew, the act of getting drunk was something that would convict me. I would get convicted. Go, going out and getting drunk as a new believer would be so grievous. It would be so grievous and convicting for me. And then as I grew more, even just the desire to get drunk, even just having the desire to get drunk would convict me. I, I wouldn't actually go out and get drunk. I would fight the temptation and I would resist it and I would win. But just having the desire was grievous and convicting for me. And even more so now, it's, it's, it's grievous and convicting to me if I ever look back on my days of drunkenness with fondness. I'm not tempted anymore to get drunk. I don't have a desire to get drunk anymore. But just looking back and seeing my days of drunkenness as anything other than death, that convicts me and that, that grieves me. I'm convicted by it. And the only reason that my sensitivity to sin is so high is that as time goes on, I am growing closer and closer to the Lord. This is where the battle starts, nearness to God. This is where this battle starts. You gotta be near to God. And I found that as, as I've grown in the Lord, I don't so much have to battle lustful activities. I don't have to battle lustful activities. I don't have, I don't have a battle with pornography. I don't have a battle with, with chasing sexual pleasures in, in, in other people. I don't, I don't necessarily have to battle to keep sexual thoughts out of my mind. Glory be to God. But the battle has become now to keep the seed of sexual thoughts out of my mind. And that's where this idea comes of, of plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand. I already know, I already know that I don't want any sexual thoughts in my mind, unless they're about my wife. I already know I don't wanna have any sexual thoughts in my mind. I agree with God on that front. I'm in total agreement with God on that front. My desire is to have his mind to have his mind when it comes to these things. I want these thoughts, these sexual thoughts to have no home in my mind. So now I need to fight the battle to avoid the seed of those thoughts coming into my mind. There's a saying that I heard, it says, you can't keep the birds from flying around your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. And that's why I don't watch certain movies. That's why I check what's in a certain movie before I attempt to watch it. You guys have heard me say this. I go to imdb.com. I, if I want to see a movie, I, I, I search that movie. I look at the parent's guide because people will post up like what things are in this movie, sex and nudity, violence, language, all that stuff. And if I see that there is any nudity, anything sexually uh, arousing or whatever, like, okay, I guess I'm not watching that movie. That's why I don't watch certain movies. That's why I avoid listening to certain types of music. That's why I avoid certain things. That's why I avoid certain people. That's why I avoid certain activities because my awareness and my sensitivity to sin is so high. I know if I engage in these things, I will lose. I will lose. Some people may think, like, why would you avoid like watching these movies, why would you avoid watching that TV show? It's not that big of a deal. I remember I found out, I remember when I first found out, no judgment, but I remember when I found out about some Christians that were watching the show Game of Thrones, I've never watched it. I've never watched it, don't tell me if you have, but I've never watched it, but what I found out, and I was shocked, when I found out that these people were watching, these Christians were watching this show, I was shocked because I had heard from multiple sources, both, both Christian and non-Christian sources, that this show was basically softcore pornography. Like, it's just like gratuitous nudity. nudity. Gratuitous nudity. Like, that, that, that's, it seemed like, here's nudity, but also here's the storyline. And I remember when I heard, like, man, cr cr like mature Christian men are watching this thing? That's crazy. 
I'm not strong enough to watch that stuff. If you are great, I doubt it, but I'm not strong enough to watch that stuff and it not affect me. I'm not strong enough for a lot of things. Man, we gotta come to a realization that we are not strong enough for a lot of things. It's, don't be proud. I am not strong enough for these things. There are some podcasts that I've listened to in the past, you know, just like, cause I'm interested in the information or I'm interested in the person because I think this person's interesting. And, and sometimes the conversation will go, I, I start to sense, oh, this conversation is going to an inappropriate place. I stop listening. I'm like, I'm done. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that. There was a time when I was working for the police department and I'd be out patrolling, just writing tickets. So you're by yourself for like 10 hours. And so I would listen to podcasts and I would listen to a, a, true, crime, a true crime podcast. And it got to the point where I had to stop listening to the, the, the true crime podcast because as I'm listening to this stuff, all, all of this information, all of these disgusting things that people do in humanity, all of these gross things that they do to children and to women, and th these things are in my mind, and I begin to imagine these things, and now I have these visuals in my mind of these things that have happened, these gross, disgusting things. It's like, dude, I can't listen to this stuff anymore. I can't listen to this stuff. I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough to withstand these direct exposures to sin. So I avoid these things. And that's what plucking out my eye and cutting off my hand looks like for me. That's what it looks like for me. But you need to figure out what that looks like for you. What does that look like for you? What things do you need to cut out of your life? What things do you need to sacrifice in order to be not just sexually pure in your mind, but wholly pure in your mind? But since the context of our verses tonight, they're coming from a sexual perspective, this needs to be said. In general, in general, this specific type of sin, it's usually a larger battle for men. I'm looking at y'all. This particular type of sin and temptation, it's usually, generally, a harder battle for men. There are exceptions, but in general, you have whole ministries, whole ministries. You have hundreds of books written, whole ministries dedicated to helping men overcome this, this, these sexual temptations and these, these sexual um, sins in their lives. I remember when I, was, when I was a younger believer, I was about two or three years in the Lord, I was meeting with the men of our church for a men's Bible study. And one of the older men, much older, like, my, like 70s or 80s, like he was, he was much older. He's been married for like 50 or 60 years. Like this, this was a godly man. Like this, this man loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. This man loved his wife. His wife was like, you know, she was older. She was a little more frail. You know, she, she needed a lot of help. This man was serving his wife. He loved his wife. This man was an example to all of the men in that church of what it means to be a godly man and a godly husband. And during this, this men's Bible study, as we're all talking, he mentioned something about how the enemy uh, continues to use scantily clad and underdressed women as a way to tempt him in his life. And I remember looking at him shocked. I was shocked. Because like at the time, I'm like a 20, 21-year-old kid, young man dealing with my own sexual temptations and, you know, in the prime of my life. Like hormones are still raging at that point. And, and I looked at him and I was like, Wait, at your age, like at, at your age, this is still something that men have to deal with? Like this is still a factor for men, even at your age? And basically what I was communicating with, that, with those questions, I didn't say these words out loud, but basically what I was communicating with these questions was, dude, you're old. You are old. Like, your body is not what it used to be. Like, look, I, you're a healthy older man. I get it. You're like, you still got a little bit of pep in your step. Like, you still got some life in you, but your body doesn't work like it used to. You're, you're, you're old. Like, you're not sexually dead yet? Again, I didn't say those words. I just said, like, it's still a thing. <laughs> and he was just, like, humbly, like, yeah. You know, like, it's, I still have this flesh. I still have this flesh. All that to say, in general, in general, this area of sin and temptation generally is an issue 
for men. However, both men and women bear some responsibility for the presence of this type of sin and temptation. Men, men, we need to govern ourselves. We need to govern ourselves. This is serious. Ultimately, we are going to be held accountable for our own sins. We are going to be held accountable for our own willful sins, and we're going to be held accountable for our own stumblings. You can't blame anybody but yourself for the things that you do and the things that you choose to dwell on. I couldn't help it, man. Everything was just out there on display. It's not going to work with God. It's not going to work with God. You will ultimately bear the responsibility for these things. I mean, look at Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter three. Don't turn there, but I'm just saying. Remember this story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Who was the first one to eat the fruit and take a bite? Who was the first one to eat the fruit? Who was the one that was deceived by the serpent and took the fruit and took the first bite? Was it the man or the woman? Anybody? Can't hear you. The woman, woman, right? But who do we talk about sin entering through? Who, who do we talk about when, when we talk about sin, when we talk about the representative of original sin, who do we talk about? The man or the woman? Adam, the man, the man. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. In Adam, all die. Not in Eve, all die. In Adam, all die. The first Adam was a failure. The last Adam, that's our savior. He gave us freedom. I mean, First Timothy, I mean, in First Timothy, it points out that Eve was the one who was deceived and, 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 and took the fruit first. But Adam is the one who gets all of the responsibility for it. Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew. His wife said, hey, try this fruit. You don't think he knew which fruit he, she was offering? He wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing. So men, there are no excuses. None. There are no excuses. We need to govern ourselves. We need to flee from youthful lusts. We don't resist youthful lusts. We don't fight youthful lusts. We flee youthful lusts. We run away from youthful lusts. Cut that hand off. Pluck that eye out. Get serious. But this does not relieve you, ladies. This does not relieve you. You need to govern yourselves as well. You need to govern yourselves as well. Don't contribute to the stumbling of your brothers. Watch how you behave. Watch how you interact. Women have a lot of power. My wife will tell you. She, like, she knows. She openly admits it. Not, as, not coming from a place of like, hey, hey, I'm the queen. Not at all. Like She comes at it from a place of like, Dude, women have so much power over men, and women can be so evil with that power. Her words, not mine. This ain't no chauvinist up here, even though I am a little bit. I'm just kidding. I'm not. But women have so much power. They have so much power. Watch how you behave. Watch how you interact. Watch how you dress. Watch how you dress. Don't be flirty just because you like the attention. Don't do that. You know, it's, it's interesting to me. I don't know. I could be wrong. You know what? I'm not even going to say it because I could be wrong. I'm not going to say it. But I remember when I was, uh, some time ago, I was speaking with a young lady, and she was telling me about how she didn't appreciate how at her, at her home church, like she, she, she has a home church, um, she didn't appreciate how at her home church, how they treated her. She felt like everybody at her home church, like they would look down on her, that they would, they would be like judgmental towards her. Um, like she felt judged because you know, everyone at her church um, was, a little, was a little more conservative. They're a little older, a little more conservative. And, and, and she felt like because of the way that she dressed, that everybody was looking down on her, judging her because of it. And I told her, you know, I was like, dude, that ain't right. Like, I'm sorry that, that your home church is doing that. You know, she shouldn't, she shouldn't feel that people are looking down on her or judging her. That's not loving. But I also told her that as the people of God, we do need to make sure that we are representing him well that we are representing him in a holy way, even in the way that we dress, even in the way that we dress. And I made sure to point that out because old girl was wearing 
a bright look at me dress. Like she, it, this thing was crazy. She's, this, this dress went down to here, went up to here. Like she was wearing like a, hey, look at me. Like this dress was designed to show off the body. That's what it was designed for. But it's so cute. Well, I hope that whatever you decide to wear is cute enough to help you deal with the fact that you are a cause for stumbling for somebody. Someone is leaving your presence. Someone is leaving your presence battling with the guilt and the frustration of having to deal with this sexual temptation and these sexual thoughts. And again, men bear the responsibility, okay? Men bear the responsibility for their own actions and their own thoughts that they decide to have, the own thoughts that they decide to dwell on. But the other party also bears some of the responsibility if, if you regard your fashion or your desire to be cute, if you regard that higher than your desire to be loving towards your brother. Paul said, if, me, if the fact that I eat meat is a stumbling block for my brother or sister, I never want to eat meat again. How loving is that? If, if something that I am doing is causing my brother or sister to stumble, Paul said, I'm never doing that again. Meat is delicious. Y'all women don't understand. It's not tofu. It's not fake chicken. Meat is delicious. But he said, look, if me eating this food causes my brother to stumble, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. This is the love we should have. So here's a tip that I've heard from an old preacher. Some of you guys have heard me say it before. Um, you know, it's, a really, it's a really good tip regarding you know, how, how we dress. You know, and this goes for women and men. Uh, because women aren't the only ones who can be tempted to flaunt what they have. Um, but if, if the way that you dress, if the way that you dress directs people to look at your body, if the way that you are dressed causes people's attention to go, oh, then it's sensual. You should probably stay away from it. But if the way that you dress causes people to look up at your face, from which the glory of God shines through. We talked about that a few weeks ago. God's glory shines through your face. If the way that you are dressed causes people to look up at your face and to see the joy on your face, it's probably a good way to go. Ultimately, though, ultimately what all of this boils down to is maturity. This all boils down to maturity. Anybody who has a problem, I mean, <sighs> I could be risking something by saying this, but anybody who has a problem with what I just said has an issue with maturity. Maybe you're not quite mature yet. But this all boils down to maturity, spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity. And with that spiritual maturity comes the desire and the ability to die to worthless things, to die to sinful things, and, and to die to things that aren't necessarily bad. You know, these things might be good, but they're just not the most excellent things. They're not the most edifying things for you. But that comes with spiritual maturity. You know, there's a story of D.L. Moody preaching in Philly. And uh, a woman comes up to him and says, Mr. Moody, I don't like you. By the way, D.L. Moody was a famous evangelist from way back in the day. Um, so she's like, Mr. Moody, I don't like you. And he said, why? Because you are so narrow, she said. I didn't think I was narrow, Mr. Moody replied. Why do you think I am narrow? Because you don't believe in the dance, the woman said. You don't believe in the cards. You don't believe in the theater. You don't believe in anything nice. Uh, insert your own hangups, like the, the cards in the theater and the dance, these are all the things that people would do. The, these were the worldly things. Um, nowadays, you got Christians playing cards, which eh, it's not a big deal, um, as long as you ain't gambling. Anyway, insert your own little hangups. I don't like that you don't listen to pop music. You know, why do you not listen to pop music? Why don't you watch, you know, these, these TV shows? Insert your own thing. Let me tell you something, he said. I, I go to the theater whenever I want to. What? She exclaimed, you go to the theater whenever you want to? Ah, oh, I do like you, Mr. Moody. You are much broader than I thought. Yes, Mr. Moody replied, I go to the theater whenever I want to. 
I just don't want to. Oh, man. Man. That is beautiful. That is so beautiful to me. Like, it just hit me. It didn't hit me when I was reading it earlier and preparing this message, but just right now, dude, that, that hit me. I can go to the theater whenever I want to. I just don't want to. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. And, and, and my prayer is that this is where all of you want to be as well. I pray that this is where you want to be, to be so disconnected and to be so unattached from the world and the things of the world that they hold no power over you. That's where I want to be. And I, personally, like, I already see, I already see like, little evidences of this, of this thing in my life so far. Like, I could spend hours and hours watching TV, you know, the TV shows that I used to really, really like, you know, watching The Office or Scrubs or Parks and Rec or The Walking Dead. Like, you know, I, I, can, I can do this. I can watch those shows all day whenever I want to. I, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. That's the spiritual maturity that we need to strive for. Not just in the gray area things like TV shows and music, but, but especially in the areas of explicit sin. We need to be so spiritually mature that when the temptation comes our way, be it sexual or any other temptation, we can say with D.L. Moody that because we have freedom in Christ now, we can engage in these things if we wanted to. I can engage in that sexual temptation if I wanted to. I just don't want to. I just don't want to. That's what I want our hearts to be. That's what I want. That's what I want my heart to be. And that's how, that's how you are going to be able to, to chop off hands and pluck out eyeballs. Your desires and your passions, they've moved beyond the things of this world, the realm of this world, and you are desiring the things above. Colossians chapter three, verses one through 11 says this. It says, so if you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once, you once walked in these things. You once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, but now, Put away all of the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. There's no Mexican, there's no Guatemalan, there's no African, there's no blood or crip. There's, am I missing something? There's no Canadian, there's no Nigerian, there's no Salvadorian. I, there's too many Latin American countries to, I'm sorry, there's no Dominican Republican. I don't know if that's how you say it. But Christ is in all Christ is all and in all. This is the goal. This is the aim. This is the, the charge for all of us to, to set your mind on things above. Keep these things in your mind as we prepare to enter into our time of prayer. But before we do that, I just want to make sure I put out the invitation. So we, we're, talking about, we're talking about living holy. We're talking about cutting off hands and plucking out eyeballs. If there's anybody in here who does not know the forgiveness and the salvation of Jesus, it is available to you as a free gift. It is a free gift that Christ offers to you. The thing that must take place is that you must believe that he died for your sins on the cross and you must repent of your sins. You must stop doing those things that we're giving you eternity in hell, that we're causing God's judgment to fall upon you. You have to believe, you have to repent, 
You have to begin walking with the Lord. So if there's anybody in here who doesn't, who's not yet made that profession of faith and you wanna make a profession of faith, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand so we can all pray for you. Don't be embarrassed if that's you. Dude, you're among believers who want to see people get saved. So if there is anybody in here who has not yet been, uh, who has not received that gift of salvation, raise your hand so we can all pray for you. Anybody, I'll wait. Anybody. Telephone. Anybody else? All right. Let's all pray for Telly. Father, we just want to lift up Telly to you, Lord. I thank you, God, that you've spoken to him. And Father, uh, God, I just pray that through this, this act, Lord, this, him stepping out and, and just saying, hey, I, I need to be forgiven. I need salvation. God, I pray that you would cause him uh, to be born again. I pray that through this, this faith that he has exercised tonight, that your spirit would come down on him, would cause him to be different, give him a brand new heart, a heart made of flesh, remove his heart of stone. And God, I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit so that he can know that he is yours and that he can, he can begin to live a new life of repentance and a life of following you, a life of reading the Bible, a life of fellowshipping with your people and growing in this grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God. I thank you so much for what, what has happened tonight, God. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.